Some people believe that death is the final certainty of life. Have you ever heard that? There's two things you got to do. Die and pay taxes. You can't actually get out of paying taxes. Could maybe go to jail for it, but you can get out of it. But actually, death isn't the most certain thing. There's even more, one more certain thing than death, the return of Christ. Jesus said that he is coming back. A couple of verses just kind of start us there. Acts 1, Acts, no, let's go to John 14, 1. John 14, 1. That's not on your outline, but anyhow, that's all right. John 14, 1, uh, and we'll, verses 1 through 3, and then we'll look at Acts 1 and 11. Talking about two different events, but it's talking about Christ coming back. And so I want you to get excited that Christ is coming back for you and for me. All those who know the Lord. And that's what reason I said, you know, death is certain, but when Jesus comes back to rapture the church up, all those who are alive, well, guess what? They'll never die. There's going to be some people that never die. So his return is more certain than death. And that's, that's pretty awesome. Chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, Jesus is just getting ready to go to the cross and he's going to leave his disciples and he's just telling them that. And they're sad. Their hearts are broken. And they're three years they have spent with Jesus. Uh, and uh, they are... It says in verse four, or chapter 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He's coming back. He's preparing a place for us. And he's coming back to get us and take us there. Isn't that great? Acts 1.11. Acts 1.11. Here again, Jesus has been meeting with, after his ascension, he's come back down. He's talked to his disciples they have asked him questions about the future. But anyhow, in Acts 11, all of a sudden they're standing there and Jesus is transported right into the clouds. And there in verse 11 it says, actually go back to verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, angels, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So again, Jesus is coming back and he's going to come back two parts of his second coming. One part he'll meet in the clouds. The other part, as it says here, he's going to put his feet on the earth. And, it's, and in verse, verse 12 it says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. So he's going to come back and put his feet on the earth on Mount Olivet. But also, as we're going to see as we're looking through here, we're going to see that he's going to call the church and meet him where at? In the clouds. Two different events, part of the second coming. And we'll look at those as we go along. You know, for God, everything is now. The past the present and the future are now. He doesn't have a yesterday and he doesn't have a tomorrow. Do you understand that? I, if you do, I'm glad you do. Because God sees all things from the beginning to the end. And as a result, the future is not unknown to God. God knows the future. That's why he can tell us what's going to happen in the future. And God's laid out events that are going to happen, but we don't know the exact date and the exact hour that those things are going to happen, as we'll see as we unfold these things as we go through the book of Revelation. But because the Bible is a book written in human terms, much of its content has to do with that which has not yet come to pass as far as time is concerned. 
One-fifth of the Bible addresses matters of future time. One-fifth of the Bible. Many of the Bible's predictions have already come to pass, such as those relating to the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yet many prophecies remain unfilled, especially those having to do with the events sound surrounding the second coming. They still haven't happened yet. And we'll, we'll, we'll be studying those. For instance, the return of Christ to earth is referred to 318 times in the New Testament. So I think God's trying to tell us something. You can count on Jesus Christ is going to come back to this earth and set up a kingdom that he offered the first time around. Now, if you read the Gospels, Jesus preached the kingdom is what? At hand. <laughs> the king was here <laughs> and the kingdom could have come if they wouldn't have rejected him and nailed him to the cross and then started what we know as today as the church age. And we'll see that God's going to wrap that all up. The church age is going to wrap it all up at the rapture of the church. And uh, we'll be looking at those things. The book we study in this series, Revelation, has to do almost exclusively with end time events associated with the return of Christ. Just as I shared with you in Acts 1, 11 and 12, Jesus is coming back and we'll see him do that. Revelation chapter 19. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll go through that so you'll see those things take place as we do that. But uh, we want to make sure you understand that, that we are looking forward to the glorious appearing of our Savior. And then the day when he comes back, the second coming, he's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He came to save. He comes to judge. It's known as the day of the Lord. Ze Zechariah 14, and we'll look at those two. But the next event on God's calendar is the rapture. The snatching up, the catching away. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Chapter 4, I'm sorry. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I want you to read it with your own eyes. You can see it because you're going to say, well, where is that word rapture? Now, we don't call Ron rapture Ron for nothing. He gets excited about end time events. But you're going to find out, as we're going to see at the end of this message, whenever we get there, that wherever prophecy is announced in the New Testament, almost always there's an admonition on how we should live. So it's not just to fill our heads with something. It's to have a response in our hearts to Jesus Christ could come back before we get done with this service. Are you ready? Make sure you're prepared and that you're ready because you won't get that opportunity uh, after he comes. So anyhow, I, I will tell you more about that too. But in 1 Thessalonians, uh, we see that in the book of 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, and Revelation that the church is known as the bride of Christ. He's the groom. We're the bride. And a bride eagerly awaits the day of her marriage to the bridegroom. So the church eagerly awaits the appearing of her bridegroom. And that's going to happen, I believe, at the rapture. And there it says, verse 13, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. This is one of my reasonings. I was reading that verse again this morning about making sure that we understand what we're hearing. I, I kid you, uh, J. Vernon McGee said the ignorant brethren is the biggest denomination in America. Amen. I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to know what God says about his coming. So it will excite you just like Ron. Get you excited that he's coming back. But also help us see we have a responsibility to tell folks that we want to go with us. Right? Yeah, we, we'd like to take all of our family and friends and those with us. He said, 
the story had come here that the rapture had already taken place and blah, 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 and they were worried about those that had died, well, what's going to happen with them. And, but I do not want you to be ignorant. They actually thought the second coming had taken place. Someone had wrote a false letter. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So he says, if you are truly a believer, if you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you die, <laughs> and you're buried, or if your body is out on the ocean and you died out there and it all ate up by sharks or whatever else is out there. Or if you got in a fire and it's all burned up. It, it, see, that doesn't slow God down any. God says that when he comes back, this is what's going to happen. He says, for this we say to you that the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now in Corinthians it tells us that we're going to be changed in a twinkling of an eye. And actually that's as fast as it takes for light to reflect off the lens of your eye. That's quicker than a blink. So this is going to happen like this. We're going to be gone. The dead's going to come out of there with new bodies. We're going to get new bodies, and we're with the Lord in the clouds. And that's why I want you, to, as we continue, it says, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. So see, those who are alive, they're not going to face one thing that a lot of folks don't look forward to, dying. They're going to be alive. See, that's why it's more certain of his return. Together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. Make sure you see those verses because folks get this messed up and they try to put both of these things happening at the same time, not realizing that we're going to meet the Lord in the air. Okay. And thus we shall, how long be with the Lord? Woohoo! Is that a great day? That ought to get your blood going. That ought to get your, the goosebumps flowing. I'm going to go to be with the Lord. I'm going to have a new body, and I'm going to be with him forever. And I can't wait to see that mansion he's built for me. I can't wait to see it. It's going to be fantastic, even better than we could ever think. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Isn't that great? We no longer have to be afraid of death. That's, not, that's a victory for us. <laughs> that's a victory for us. So the next thing he's doing, he's coming back. To get the church and meet them in the air. When he gets the church and he picks them up there, we will actually have the wedding of the Lamb. And we will be married to Jesus Christ as the bridegroom of Christ forever, for always. Also, it says when we get raptured up that we're going to face a judgment seat. It's called the Bema seat. It's the judgment seat of Christ. Folks get scared about that because they're afraid they're getting judged for their sins and whether they're going to get in heaven or not. Well, where is that going to take place? In heaven. <laughs> so if you were going to face that judgment, you were, but the judgment seat of Christ is not for our salvation. It's for our rewards. It's for our works. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and uh, verses 11 through 15. You can take time and, and look that up. But you will be rewarded for your faithfulness. God doesn't require you the same thing he requires of me. He requires every person here that they may be found faithful. We were just looking at a man this morning, Joshua. There was a faithful man. A man who is obedient to the things that God calls him to do. God just calls everyone here with the talents and the money and the time you have to be faithful with that as far as he's concerned. That's what he asks. So he doesn't ask the same thing from each one of us. 
and we'll get those crowns. And what I love about it is we go through Revelation. One day we're going to take those crowns and we're going to cast them at Jesus' feet. Isn't that great? I hope I got so many wheelbarrows that I can fill it up where you can't see them. That won't happen. Not because I have that, won't have that many rewards. It's because that you can't ever block the view of Christ in heaven. He is the whole focus of heaven. <laughs> he should be the focus of our life now. But he will be the focus of everything in heaven. That's what Revelation's all about. The revealing, that's what that word means. The unveiling, the revealing of Jesus Christ in his future glory. Oh boy. When we'll see him as he is. Instead of seeing him through these rose colors. If you're an old John Connolly fan. Uh, that may not know, some of you may not know that one. But anyhow, when we see him clearly, that's what Paul says, that one day we'll see him clearly. Now we see him as through a, a mirror. And Matthew 24 gives us some insights or some signs that will precede the coming of the Lord. And, and I'm going to say this, but I want us to be careful. God never called the church to live by sight. He says, you live by faith, not by sight. But the Jews, it says, require a sign. And there will be signs. We'll see the shadows of those. We see them happening today. You see the nation fall, the nations falling apart. We see an emphasis upon the nation of Israel. Matter of fact, we see a hateful attitude to God's chosen people. And that's going to continue to build. That's going to continue to build until it escalates and to a point that it looks like there's no hope. And guess what? Then the second coming of Christ will happen and we'll have the battle of Armageddon. And we'll get there in a minute. But he's got to come back to take his church to be with them. He must come back to judge the world. After the church is raptured up, we're going to start a seven-year period called the tribulation period, the great tribulation. Jeremiah called it in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, the time of Jacob's trouble. Daniel says it's the 70th week of the 70 weeks. 69 have already happened. There's seven weeks, le one week left, seven years that seven-year period is split in half to two, three-and-a-half-year periods. In the center of that seven-year period, the Antichrist will set himself up in the temple that has been rebuilt, and he will declare that he is God. And he will require all the world to get the number of the beast. Six, six, six. And if you do not get it, you can't buy, you can't trade, you can't eat. And then if they catch you, they lop off your head. Time of great trouble. Not only do we have the world going crazy, but we have Satan get involved in all kinds of demonic activity. And then in the last and part mainly, we see God's judgments coming down upon this earth. It is a time that no one has ever experienced before. And I'm not telling you that. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ said. He said, you've never seen anything like this. Over maybe up to two-thirds of the world's population will die. Whew. Terrible time. Terrible time. It says in 2 Thessalonians... If you're right there, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, tells us a little bit about that time. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. No, I don't want 1 through 8, I want 8 through 9. Here we go. It says, backing up to verse 7, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains, no, that's not right. I want 1, 8, and 9. I'm in the wrong chapter. 
verse 7, and to give you a troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, that's the second coming, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who's that talking about? The unsaved. The unsaved will face his vengeance, his wrath. Verse 9, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now remember, folks, you have an opportunity to make a choice. You better do it today because today is the day of salvation. And once you face destruction, it's how long? Forever and ever and ever. Everlasting punishment. I know we have some folks that don't believe that. But I'm going to tell you, just as well as eternal life is forever, everlasting punishment is what? Forever. Yeah. You got to see both sides of the coins, folks. It's there. What a blessing it is to be reserved, preserved from the wrath of the Lamb, of the wrath to come, and we'll see that. He's going to come back and judge this world. 2 Timothy 4 1 says he'll judge the living and the dead. And we'll read that in Revelation chapter 20, where we see the great white throne. And all the dead and all the unsaved will stand in front of the Lord Jesus Christ and he will judge them based on their works and the evil things they've done. It's all written in the books. <laughs> it's all written in the book. It says all those will be judged except for those who have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. You got your name in there? I'm, mine's right in under, under J's, John, because I like first names. Because see, the Lord knows me by first name. He doesn't just know me by my last name. He knows me by my first name. It says he calls me by name. He calls the sheep he knows by his name. My name's written under. It could be a lot of Johns there. Could be a lot of Johns there, but you know what? It don't make any difference. I'm just glad my name's written in there. And I don't even care if it's fired under S and for Sears. I don't care where it's at, as long as it's on the list. Make sure your name is on the list. Once your name gets on the list, it cannot be removed. Just remember that. That's the Lamb's book of life. It ought to be a strong motivation for us, knowing that He's coming back to live our lives in step with the gospel and to live for Christ. Daniel tells us, we got a few minutes there. Daniel chapter 7. That's in back in your white pages now. Daniel chapter 7 is going to tell us the scope of who Jesus will rule over. Usually, I would do, it's right after Ezekiel, Daniel chapter 7. Usually I would do a series in Daniel first because he set so much groundwork. Daniel and Daniel is to the Old Testament what Revelation is to the New Testament. A lot of end time events. But in Daniel chapter 7 and verses 13 through 14, it says, I was watching in the night visions. God gave Daniel this vision of the future and behold, one like the Son of Man. Now, Jesus used that title for himself more than any other title. We're speaking of Jesus Christ here, the Son of Man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the ancients of days, and they brought him near before him. Then he was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. So when Jesus sets up that kingdom here on earth, it's an everlasting kingdom over everyone. We call that the millennial kingdom. We'll get there at a little later too, but it's a millennial kingdom. You'll say, well, what is that? It's a thousand years. That's what that word means. So here's our picture so far today. We're waiting for the rapture. 
all the believers, <laughs> all the believers will be raptured to meet the Lord in the air. Then we'll be united to him in wedlock. And then from what my understanding is, when we do come down after that seven year period, we'll have the marriage supper of the Lamb. And all Israel and all the tribulation saints will be invited in and we're going to have one feast. One guy said it's going to last for a thousand years. I don't know. It's going to be quite a feast. It's going to be quite a time. But during that time that we're taken up, then that's seven years. So you got it? Rapture, tribulation period, seven years. Then we get the millennial kingdom, 1,000 years. And then eternity forever. The new Jerusalem comes down and the Lord will be with us. He will even, we don't even have a sun and a moon anymore. We don't need it. The Lord's glory will light us up. You and I will have new bodies and we'll have, and there's the experience in no more pain, no more death, no more goodbyes, none of those things forever and ever and ever. Revelation is going to explain to us the things that are going to happen during the church age, then during the tribulation period, then the millennial kingdom, and then the eternal state in the final two chapters of Revelation 21 and 22. Really not too difficult. We're not going to make it difficult. I'm not going to try to read in a bunch of things. I just want you to get excited that Jesus is coming back. And with that excitement, get out and tell somebody about it. Because we're one day closer than we were yesterday. We don't know how many more days we're going to have to tell them. And I believe as we'll see, as we finish up this next week... That those who have heard the gospel and rejected it, they heard it, they understood it, they said, I do not want to have nothing to do with the gospel. During the tribulation period, they will be sent a strong delusion from the Lord and they will never have an opportunity to get saved again. Second Thessalonians tells it clearly that God will sing them a strong delusion and they will believe the lie that who is God? that Satan is God. That's sad news. Some folks don't like that. But it, see, you got to remember, today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off till tomorrow. <laughs> don't put it off. You don't, you're not guaranteed a second opportunity. <laughs> if you're hearing it today and you don't know it, you better respond because <laughs> you don't know. Your time is in God's hands. And we'll look at that passage closer, but you can read it. And I, and I read it when I first learned it. It shocked me. And I don't care what kind of books you read and they tell you all the things, but <laughs> remember, it's God's word that's truth. And it makes sense, right? If they already are believing and deceived by the enemy of our souls, Satan, who is the great deceiver, why aren't they going to keep on believing his lies, right? Why not? Especially when we see as we get to the tribulation period, the Holy Spirit has been removed. The restrainer of evil and the church, which is supposed to restrain evil, has been removed. So we take away those things that have such an effect upon our world. The Holy Spirit and the church. Purifying motives. We'll look at that next time together. Let's pray and then we'll have our closing song. Father, Wow, what a plan you have. And uh, I know when I first was taught these things and started seeing it from your word, I was so excited. Father, uh, it just seemed to sink into my head and my heart that you're coming back. And Father, that you're going to take the church to be with you. And Father, that you have given us a message of hope that we can avoid the wrath of God because of our sins through the cross of Calvary. And that, Father, someday we'll be out of this sin-cursed world and we'll be with you forever and ever and ever. So, Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for your word. And if there's someone here today that doesn't know for sure, if they were to die today, they'd go to heaven. 
I pray you'd work in their heart and they would ask Christ to save them. They would turn from their sins and turn to him and ask him to forgive them. And Father, that they might be born again, that they can look forward to that wonderful hope we have of a mansion prepared for us in heaven and to be with you forever. That's the important part. That is eternal life, knowing you. We just love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.